centre due to Omicron, or nearly 550 cases. That is a 14-fold increase on this day last week. Donegal GP Kieran O'Farry expects the situation to get worse. Yeah, I suppose it's concerning looking at the data coming out from uh, Britain and South Africa, where they say that the doubling rate of Omicron is uh, every two days. So that's probably the most concerning part about that, that we're likely to see uh, quite a big increase in that number of Omicron cases over the next number of days. Sinn Féin has called for the Dáil to sit next week to pass legislation needed to give people relief on energy bills. Ministers approved a plan this morning to pay €100 Euro off every household's energy bill at some point in the new year. New laws are needed to allow the government to do that, with the Taoiseach saying they'll be passed in January. There could be tougher sanctions for drink and drug driving under plans to reduce road deaths. A new strategy aims to cut the number of fatalities and serious injuries by 50% before the end of the decade. Among the proposals are a 30 kilometre speed limit in urban areas and an online reporting system for traffic offences. Almost a quarter of young adults in Ireland are overweight by the age of just 20 and 13% are obese. The SRI has been tracking the lives of 5,000 young adults since they were nine years old. That's it for now. More in an hour. News Talk Weather. Thanks to Ryanair. This Christmas, give the gift of travel with a Ryanair gift card. Cloudy over the northern half of the country tomorrow with outbreaks of rain. Highest temperatures 8 to 11 degrees in mostly moderate southwest winds. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The News Run on Off the Ball with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. This is News Talk. You're welcome along. Tuesday evenings off the ball. Joe Malo with you. So Marcel Jacobs, a name we wouldn't have been too familiar with at the start of the year, I think it's fair to say. At the end of the year, he's the 100 metres Olympic champion. He came from absolutely nowhere. He has disappeared just as quickly. Uh, Matt Lawton of the Sunday Times tried to track him down over in Rome. We're going to chat to Matt this hour. After 8 o'clock, Kevin McMenamin, huge figure in Dublin GA. He retires after 12 years with just the eight All-Ireland medals to his name. So we're speaking to him after 8 o'clock. Always really thoughtful, intelligent fella. Jerry Thornley, also after 8 as well. Every day at the moment, it feels like there are big rugby stories. Johan van Graan is stepping away from Munster at the end of the season, was today's news. And on the football show, there is Premier League action this evening, but Damien Delaney is with us after nine. 53106, the text number. We are at Off The Ball on Twitter. Richard McCormick, hello to you. Hey, Joe. Nathan Murphy, hello. Hey, Joe. A lot going on, Nathan. And uh, I mean, I know we would both like to talk about Tiger Woods' return to a golf course this weekend, but uh, that oh will have God. to... That will have to wait. That, that's obviously the big news story at the moment, but there are other things going on. It does feel very busy just now in the world of sport, does it not? If only we had a golf podcast where we could dedicate a full hour to yeah. Tiger Woods and his son, Charlie, and how they get on in the father and son invitation against Potter Carrington and his son, Paddy. Paddy and Paddy. So, yeah, Indeed. that's Indeed. not the biggest story of the week, it turns out. Well, it will be. Give it time. Give it time. It will be come Saturday evening. Lads, uh, nothing against you, Evan Grant. An early text in from uh, Graeme in Limerick. I've sort of given it away by saying nothing it against passed. Van Gran, um, but a uh, uh, decent fella, seemed like a very hard worker, but his time had come to a natural end. There was no real sense of progress for too long now. The only surprise was Munster had offered him two more years. Very best to look to him in Bath, says Graham in Limerick. Thoughts, Nathan? In a way, it didn't feel overly surprising when this news came through. Obviously, they were discussing a new two-year contract, and for a while, it seemed as though those discussions we're going well. Johan van Grand seems to have had a change of heart. Maybe the approach from Bath and uh, the money involved in that turned his head. But it just seems a constant conveyor belt at Munster for years at this stage around head coaches, backroom staff. And it's just hampering any sort of ability to get some stability and to get some momentum going. And every time they get one step forward, it feels like there's two steps back. And I'm interested in how Munster fans feel about Johan van Grand because he hasn't brought home any silverware it does feel every time they're on the verge of something there's been a setback there's been an injury at the wrong time Joey Carber even today we see with yet another injury and I don't know the culture of Munster has clearly changed dramatically over the last few years and I, I think the reaction to the Wasps game at the weekend was interesting because there were obviously a lot of caveats to that performance and that Wasps were also struggling and their COVID issues came later but it felt like there was a real pride amongst Munster people that this was the Munster Academy. These were Munster lads. These were players who should be getting their chance and maybe whose path has been blocked at times by imports from South Africa and Munster going a different way. 
and they just need to get back to sort of building a character and a culture around the club that connects with the local community. And it feels like that's been lost. And I don't think you could put all that on Johan van Graan, but it doesn't really feel like there's been, I don't, I don't think his departure will be uh, mourned too much. No, I wouldn't think so either. It's clearly a difficult job. I mean, look at the success of Razi Erasmus post Munster and Bruce Craig and Bath clearly think Johan van Graan's done a very good job but they wouldn't be trying to lure him away. But I agree, I don't think Munster fans will be heartbroken. It's tough to judge someone on no trophies, but no trophies is a fact. Increasingly, it has felt in the last 18 months or two years that there's been a recognition that the Van Graan South African style of play has not been working and they need to evolve that. And we've seen Larkham come in and yet... And go. And go. And yet in the midst of that, you know that really it's not Van Graan's natural leaning. And so the only way to really evolve and to really move things on is to get in a new head coach who really wants to play that way and play the game that way and do things that way. And so maybe it's best for all concerned. Bath is a lovely job, by the way. So really well funded, great facilities, beautiful town, very rich owner, very rich sponsor in James Dyson. Uh, he of Dyson fame and they're 0 for 9 at the moment they're having a terrible season I mean what better time to swan in there and you won't have to do very much to bring about improvement so it's, I can see how it's an attractive offer for Van Graan and maybe it's best all round Munster had offered him a two year deal mm. These things are obviously going to leak out so I presume they had no choice but to announce it now yeah. but there's still a long way to go this season and if results turn it just feels We've seen it in any amount of sports where you're a lame duck manager. Is it an ideal scenario? There's going to be so much speculation around this, and it's probably never helped Johan van Graan that so many of Munster's greatest ever players have started to go down the coaching route. And Ronan O'Gara is there, and Paul O'Connell's there, and Jerry Flannery is there, and even Felix Jones has gone off and done wondrous things in South Africa. There's no shortage of homegrown contenders to possibly go back. Which of them would take it, though? So. Which of them would take it? O'Gara wouldn't. Be, I'd be certain. O'Connell wouldn't. I'd be almost certain. Don't Not as certain. Uh, I'd be interested in O'Gara. Uh, he's obviously indicated that he doesn't have any intention of coming back right away, but like, the world has changed pretty dramatically over the last couple of years, and I wonder would that have an impact on whether or not he would return home? If only there was a way we could ask him these things. Uh, But Jerry Flannery was on the show a couple of weeks ago with Jer and it was fascinating. It's such an interesting guy and has obviously gone about his coaching career in a different way. And I wonder would there be a role for him? Or maybe am I contradicting myself? Like, is that what Munster need? Do they need one of the old guys or do they need the best coaching talent who's possibly available in the world right now? Mm. We should start the news round. It is, as ever, with thanks to Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Richie, you're starting with the uh, Munster news. So Ian Flanagan's been talking, their CEO. <clears throat> yeah, the uh, CEO says there's already work ongoing with the IRFU to identify suitable replacements for both Johan van Graan and outgoing attack coach Stephen Larkham. Speaking on the Red 78 podcast, former Munster back row Alan Quinlan explained why he thinks it might be an external influence of the fans' expectations that has informed van Graan's decision to move on. There's there's this expectation and pressure with Munster. And and I have a feeling that Johan hasn't felt the love from outside the group, I think. From what I hear internally, the players, he's very popular with the players. There's a good good morale, even though they've had to take a lot of ups and downs in the last couple of years. Um, Maybe it's outside, the outside influence and what Johan himself is feeling has made this decision. Um, the Munster fans are renowned for being wonderful fans and brilliant supporters as a team, going right back to my time. But they're pretty demanding as well and, and impatient, I think. And that impatience has increased in the last number of years. Yeah, I'd say it has as well. They've continually hit the ceiling in Europe. And then I think the Pro 16 defeated the RDS to Leinster in March of this year, where it was men against boys and they were completely outclassed. I think that was a real momentum killer. You know, that was a, you know it was laid bare the extent to which the gap had not been closed between the two sides. So I'm, I think Quinny's onto something there as well. Owen has texted, hopefully Bath won't hoover up all the new young Munster prospects. Come on. See, you, you need to mention the Dyson thing. I did mention I the Dyson thing. I said James yeah. Dyson just a minute ago. I know, but, I know, okay. but you did need... You? Like, I thought you just said rich owner. Itself. You never mentioned Dyson. I did say Dyson. Yeah. No, he did, no, he did mention Dyson. But just okay. mentioning Bath in isolation, the joke doesn't work. <laughs> but, you know, I don't want to... I don't, have I don't you got a Dyson joke? Plug all there, Joe. Blame me, on. Blame me. I do, actually. 
One of the fancy ones. I was only in the shop yesterday and I'd, I'd never properly looked at them. Oh. They're about 750 quid. Yeah, no, they're dear. They are dear. It was a wedding <laughs> gift. It was a wedding gift. Hey, but uh, Was it, yeah? Much valued. I mean, wouldn't have spent the money myself, but they're bloody great. <laughs> I, I, it's not the greatest radio job, but what's the difference between a Dyson and a, you know, regular Hoover? Oh, I mean, it really is the greatest uh, radio ever. Well, for a start, never having to plug the thing in is a joy. Do you know what I mean? You just you pick it up, off you go. That's very handy. You don't have to charge it at some stage. Yeah, occasionally. So you do plug it in. But well, not each time you gone. use it. You know what I mean? That's the real joy. You just okay, a quick, okay. quick uh, scooter in the kitchen with the Dyson without having to go and get the wire and plug it in. And then, you know, when you're trying to wind the wire back into a bloody Hoover, I mean, life's too short. Well, now you can get the ones can't you? have an automatic move recoil around the room by themselves. Yeah. The automatic recoil never seemed to work. You know what I mean? You'd step on the thing and it would work for the first seven, <sighs> eight, nine, ten inches. Of the it be, it'd be a kink in the thing, and you're having to walk off. off. Oh, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Nightmare, nightmare scenario. Listen, this is award-winning radio here and off the ball. Stay with us. More uh, conversation like this <laughs> to come. Uh, is Raj coming home, Gavin and Kilkenny? Well, I don't think I'd be shocked. Now, I'd be happily shocked because it'd be box office. But uh, I would be shocked if Roger was coming home this time around. And then Van Graan was taking the show nowhere. If all I need to be a head coach is tell a team of internationals to boot the ball up in the air and chase it, then I'll throw my name into the hats as Pat. See, that is the, I would say, not uncommon, but probably uncharitable view of what Van Graan has uh, done there. So, um, Munster fans, you can text in 53106. Jerry Thorne is going to be on the way after eight. By the way, just to uh, reiterate our half-seven story, it's a bit different. We talk a lot about the usual uh, suspects, Manchester United, Irish rugby and so on on the show. But uh, a story we thought what well worth covering as the year comes to a close is that of Marcel Jacobs, who, if you, at the start of the year, had said to anybody in athletics, who is going to win the men's 100 metres Olympic title, Nobody would have said the name Marcel Jacobs. Uh, Italian mother and uh, El Paso-born uh, father. He represents Italy and he won the Olympic final in 9.80 seconds. He had never broken 10 seconds before this year. He wasn't even on the Athletics Integrity Unit uh, testing pool. He was seen as such a rank outsider and he's come from nowhere and he's won the Olympic final and disappeared just as quickly. Hasn't taken part in any of the Diamond League meetings and Matt Lawton of the Sunday Times tried to track him down, wrote a great piece about it. There are also links with uh, Giacomo Spazzini, who's been investigated for the use of, uh, he's a nutritionist, use of drugs to alter athletic performance in what the Italian police are calling Operation Muscle Bound. Not the most subtle of uh, Operation <laughs> titles, but I like it. Does what it says in the tin. Maybe they're uh, just big Spandau Ballet fans. Yeah, indeed. So it's an extraordinary story and the Olympic world champion is one of those marquee titles, you know, akin to heavyweight champion of the world, which is just a real blue ribbon event. And it's an extraordinary situation. He is, by all accounts, going to compete again in Berlin in February ahead of the world championships over the summer. It'd be interesting to see what reception he gets. Obviously, he denies any wrongdoing whatsoever. He was a long jumper uh, before 2019. So he's just turned his hand to sprinting. Turns out he's bloody good at it. It is a sign of how far from grace the 100 metres has fallen that if you were to ask in an end of season quiz who won the 100 metres at this year's Olympics I'd say an awful lot of people would struggle to remember the name Marcel Jacobs yeah well we were just saying for our you know even things like um, putting up the YouTube version of it we were just chatting on uh, teams and saying probably just need to call him Olympic champion as opposed to Marcel Jacobs to you know for people to know what this is about because yeah you wouldn't I mean if you said to people Marcel Jacobs I don't think the majority would uh, be able to say, oh, yeah, the Olympic champion. So that's on the way half seven with Matt Lawton, which uh, should be a really good chat. Joey Carberry, Rich, so uh, guy can't catch a break. Yeah, Joey Carberry once again facing a lengthy spell on the sidelines. Munster confirmed today that the out half requires surgery on Thursday, having sustained a fractured elbow seven minutes from the end of Sunday's win away to Wasps. No time frame has been placed on his recovery. But as you might imagine, with an injury of that nature, he's likely to be in a race to be fit for Ireland's Six Nations campaign. Yeah, really desperate. Look, it was interesting on Monday Night Rugby, we asked uh, Nathan Gordon Darcy, overall takeaway from the Munster performance? And he said, Joey Carberry, he's back. Not for long, eh? Not for long. Terrible. And now we're into the same situation, race against time for the Six Nations. Does he get a couple of games towards the end? Do we need to back Harry Byrne? Do we need to back Ross Byrne? Yeah, it's it's such a shame. We We should do a piece on the Irish out half situation on the show sometime, don't you think? I don't know. Did, did Depth need to chart, Joe. Past good. Johnny Sexton? Didn't he start past <laughs> Johnny Sexton? Surely he'll never make the World Cup, will he? Yeah. Montpellier-Leinster, meanwhile. 
Yeah, intriguing one this. Leinster Montpellier confirming additional COVID-19 cases ahead of Friday's Heineken Champions Cup encounter in France. Leinster managed to return to training today with the top 14 side are preparing in smaller groups, having confirmed a fifth case this morning. Montpellier said they'll conduct another round of testing tomorrow, but there's one side definitely seems more keen to play this game than the other. And to be fair, without being cynical on, uh, over anything, uh, and genuinely uh, not being cynical, there is obviously an advantage <clears> to being willing to play the game because unlike mm. Premier League where it's postponed and there's no Manchester United Brentford for instance this evening Nathan the side who can't fulfil the fixture in the Heineken Champions Cup because the schedule is so tight and there are no spare weekends it won't be postponed it will be a 28 nil defeat so if you can avoid saying we can't play the game it's of major benefit well, the precedent has been set, and rather brilliantly, by Munster and what they did last weekend. And how far down into that academy can Leinster go if they need to get the players together to go and fulfil this game? Like Rugby's in a different position in that there's no wiggle room at all. There's no wiggle room at all for the Champions Cup to try and replay these fixtures. But this is going to be the dominant talking point on news rounds for the next month, six weeks, postponements issues around players and vaccinations and Omicron and the rapid spread and don't need to get into the science of how serious it is or not Mm. but it's clear it's far more transmissible which means there's going to be far more cases and players aren't going to be able to play if they're testing positive or if they're close contacts so I think we're going to see a huge amount of Premier League games called off over the Christmas it's hard to see how how we won't consider it feels like we're at the early stages of this and there's one game off, there might be another one off over the next couple of days and it's going to be a bit of a mess because while football can have sort of afford postponements, they've also packed that calendar pretty tightly as well. The teams are going to end up like last season playing three games in a week. So yeah, the, there's no way around it. There's nobody at fault for any of this. But anything that means you don't have to give that walkover I think is is probably the way forward. Well, should the Leinster game go ahead on Friday, we have live commentary here on Off the Ball. Build up from seven o'clock. Kickoff is at eight. Naturally enough, all the listeners want to talk about our Dysons now. Uh, Chris, <laughs> and I would agree with Chris here in defence of the texter own. He got it right there. If he had mentioned Dyson, then all the subtlety would have been gone. See, I think that's the point. He had to just throw it out there. If you got the Hoover up line, you got it. If you didn't, move on. Owen doesn't need you in his life. It's fair. I think so. Uh, Dysons, like Ronaldo, are a cod says one time (laughs) 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 he said the battery lasts about two minutes I can't be here in for two minutes it's a 60 minute job 6-0 says James P.S. wow how big is your house indeed Richie can you do me a power city deal please I wish I could I wish I wish (laughs) join the queue I'm begging Richie for a power city deal Uh, I found literally around the block at this stage I found the battery life absolutely fine now I'd... I'm just wondering like you still have to do the hoovering yourself whereas there is these new ones that you just plug in and it has the motion sensor so it moves around your floor oh yeah and it just goes around all day and keeps everything perfectly clean what are like, they, they go- can't be that much more expensive what are they going for I don't know Richie they're pretty dear in themselves City? no I'm not but they are pre- I've, I've, I've looked into them before because there's one in uh, Parks and Recreation that had an iPod attached to it at the time that was called DJ Roomba um, but they're pretty dear like they're, yeah, I'm not going to say surprisingly dear because it's a robot that goes around your house hoovering for God's sake it's like something out of Rocky IV uh, but yeah they are pretty pretty expensive if I had the choice between one of those I don't mind hoovering uh, but it's something kind of satisfying about it and it only takes it only takes four or five minutes uh, to do you know kitchen and downstairs uh, run around with the Dyson you don't have to do a perfect job but I tell you what I've, it, one of those lawnmowers that does it by itself now I'd have one of them no problem my garden isn't big enough. Made of mine has one, all right. They're massively impressive. Though, scared of living daylights out of any dogs around, I think. So, yeah. it's either puppy yeah. or portable lawnmower. I don't have a dog. And I'm sick of doing that back garden. Or actually, I'm sick of looking out and saying, I really need to cut the grass in the back garden. That's my life at the moment. Although, you don't, you don't really need to do Global it. warming, Joe. Global warming. You shouldn't <laughs> have had to do it for months, boss. Still growing, eh? Whew, this, it sure this, is. It just gets better and better. It sure is. Look, it's a hell of a show this evening, as you can tell. So, Joey Carberry, the football this evening is still going ahead-ish. We do have one very good game. 
Yeah, we do. Uh, potentially too, who knows? Manchester City do have the chance to establish a four-point lead at the top of the Premier League table tonight. Pep Guardiola side uh, welcome leads to the Etihad. Kickoff there is at 8pm. Meanwhile, there's a 7.45 start at Carrow Road. Dean Smith coming up against his former side with Norwich entertaining Aston Villa. Tonight's other scheduled game, as you alluded to there, the meeting of Brentford and Manchester United called off late last night due to COVID-19's outbreak among Ralph Rangnick's squad. Meanwhile, United say Victor Lindelof's breathing difficulties are not linked to the COVID outbreak at the club. The defender was replaced by Eric Bailly. 16 minutes from the end of Saturday's win away to Norwich. United say Lindelof is undergoing a series of precautionary investigations to get to the root of that issue. OK. Uh, meanwhile, interesting story at Arsenal. Yeah, they've stripped Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang today of the captaincy following a disciplinary breach. The forward will miss tomorrow's Premier League game with West Ham as well and was also dropped for Saturday's win against Southampton. Boss Mikel Arteta says he's made the decision to defend the interests of the football club and has yet to decide on a new skipper. Um, I think it's a really clear statement from the club. It's um, a decision that we have made following the incident, uh, the last incident that we have <clears throat> with the player, and um, this is where we stand. In terms of the effect of this decision on the dressing room, has there been any effect, would you say, or not? Well, they, they accepted the decision, and um, I think they, they know because they have committed to it and they have demanded that uh, we want to take our culture um, our demands and who do we want to be as a club and how we want to represent this football club to a different level and when those standards are not met you know that um, you cannot participate in, in our daily basics Well Nathan, thoughts on this? Very interesting Yeah it is uh, on the one hand it feels quite extreme but then when he talks about the culture and what the club needs to be about it's been a bit of a basket case for a good decade at this stage and there's any amount of lists of Arsenal captains over the last decades and what has happened from Granit Xhaka being booed off by his own fans and telling them where to go Lauren Koscielny was captain and refused to go on a pre-season tour because he wanted to get out of the club Robin Van Persie doesn't sign a new deal signs for Manchester United William Gallas has a meltdown in the middle of the pitch at St Andrews and that's just the most recent group Cesc Fabregas is in there as well so we all look at Arsenal and think it's a squad that has lacked character and lacked leadership. And maybe Mikel Arteta, having been there now for over a year, has realised that, yeah, I need players who can step up at the right time. And uh, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang is not that player. It's hard to see how he doesn't leave the club in January uh, if they can get rid, mm. considering the incredible wages that he is on and like, his performances have been pretty shocking. But... There, there is a bit of an obsession with the captaincy at Arsenal and maybe because of all that's gone wrong they had this rotation of five different captains as well at one stage and that was daft yeah it was uh, it was it was crazy but listen, Arteta is clearly deciding he needs to be a bit of a disciplinarian here and it's, it's, it, it does seem a bit crazy but they need something mm. I think when you have a young dressing room it's important as well to have that bit of discipline. It seems he had to go abroad to bring home his mother who wasn't well. So, I mean, the reasons for going abroad were very fair. It's just the lateness on return was obviously a step too far. He does, uh, Thomas Tuchel talked in May about Aubameyang and actually talked about him very fondly on, of their time at Dortmund together, but did say he was late for everything. You know, if we wanted him there for 11, we had to say 10.45. And look, you know, look at that game last. Yeah, look at that game last year where he turned up late for it because he was like stuck in traffic and stuff like that. Because yeah. you know, he just hadn't his, his time management's all over the gap. Like he can't, like whatever about him being a talented player, you just can't have that kind of stuff in the squad, particularly one of a kind of delicate nature that Arsenal's is. Like the balance of that is, is thrown off if the slightest thing goes wrong. So you need to be, yeah, you need to have, you need to have dependable characters. Yeah. And Pierre Emerick Aubameyang is not a dependable character, as talented a player as he is. Doesn't seem so. Because like Tuchel was saying, when he would arrive at training, he'd be apologetic and all oh, really, really sorry and sprinting out with his laces <laughs> open. And then he, but then once he, once he was there, he was incredibly hard working. So it wasn't, you know, a, a kind of a black or white situation. He's all good or he's all, t all terrible. Like he was good when he was there, but there was that flakiness, I suppose. And, and Arteta's obviously said enough is enough. I guess if he was scoring uh, 20 goals this side of Christmas, Nathan, they might have tolerated it a bit more. So it's probably goes hand Well, that's hand. the other problem. His performance is uh, really since he signed the contract. And I know he had injury issues, COVID issues and things like that last season. But his form has just fallen off a cliff that it looked like they were already looking at replacing them next summer anyways. But it is just the size of the wages that mean they might be stuck with him for now. Fellas, we are out of time. The listeners hoovered up that content. My thanks to you both. Two Hoover jokes and one user on job. I just basically stole Owen <laughs> Owen's joke and repackaged it terribly. <laughs> Nathan Murphy, thank Tomorrow you. Night ironing. Yeah. Nathan Murphy, thank you very much. 
Thanks, lads. Richie, thank you. Nice one. All you need for Christmas. News Talk's Christmas cash machine. Oh, get in there. Oh, thank you. Oh, my God, I can't believe it. Your chance to win big. 